Good evening. I think we'll get started. If you can find a seat. Thank you. My name is Andy Rotter. I am the director of the Peace and Conflict Studies program and professor of history here. And um, I have uh, a good and very small job tonight, which is essentially to be the MC, uh, to introduce the introducers. Um, thanks for coming. Welcome. This is the fifth annual Pete Scherer lecture. And uh, the first person I'd like to introduce is uh, someone who's been closely associated with the series for a long time. And we'll talk a bit about Pete Scherer, who graduated from Colgate in 1965. Um, everyone you talk to who knew Pete Scherer um, is, I think, uh, you know, profoundly moved by, by his memory, by, by who he was. He was someone who. Um, went on to do a PhD at Columbia Teachers College and uh, wrote a dissertation, a 612-page dissertation called uh, McCarthyism and Academic Freedom. And I think you know which side he was on. Uh, but the, the person I'd like to introduce can, can say more about Pete than I can, uh, Dan Chuckers. and sometimes not providing the answers, but he was a voice of reason, a voice for tolerance. And the more I reflect on Pete, I tend to think of the great British politician, and philosopher, Edmund Burke. Burke was somebody who thought that change comes to society. It has to come to all societies. It has to come slowly, though. It can't be a radical change. I don't want anyone to think that Pete was a radical, but he had very strong views and he believed Change. He believed in change sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but he never believed in violent change. He was a person who believed in moderation. All his friends will tell you that. He was a person who believed in rationality and a person who believed in tolerance. He's, he's a unique individual and he's one of the best friends I've ever had. I hope you enjoyed the next lecture. I'd now like to introduce Dan Monk, um, who has been instrumental in making the series work year in and year out. Dan is the Cooley Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at Colgate, Professor of Geography, Professor also in, um, in the MIST program. Uh, and Dan will introduce the speaker, Dan. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the fifth annual Peter C. Scherer Memorial Lecture in Peace and Conflict Studies. Um, before I introduce this year's speaker, Professor Erica Chenoweth, uh, 
I'd like to offer you three important uh, invitations. First, I'd like to invite you to turn off your cell phones so that you don't embarrass yourselves. Because I know some of your ringtones from your classes with me. Um, second, I want to um, say that um, at the close of Professor Chenoweth's lecture, we'll be holding a question and answer period. To facilitate the webcasting of this talk, we're going to have these microphones um, at the ready at the bottom of each aisle. Please don't assume that you can ask a question from your seat, even if you think you have a loud voice. It simply won't be picked up for the purposes of uh, webcasting uh, this event. Um, don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed. Come on down. Stand in line and ask your questions. Um, and third, um, we invite anyone here to join us after the lecture um, to, at, the, at a celebratory reception at the Colgate Inn. Uh, that'll be around 8.45 or so. Um, so, so let's begin. Um, my introduction is largely intended to serve as cliff notes for those of you who are here under duress, so take notes. The mathematical modeling of conflict isn't something new. Um, it has been attempted with varying degrees of success for almost a century if not more. But what is generally not known is the extent to which that the, ma the mathical, mathematical modeling of nonviolent collective action has shaped and influenced those efforts, seriously qualifying, challenging, and complicating normative assumptions about war and peace throughout the 20th century and after. Indeed, one really could say that the history of the interdiscipline of peace and conflict studies is in part the history of the mathematical counter logic to commonplace assumptions about war that have pervaded policy in academic spheres. And it's along that trajectory that I would like to situate the contributions of this evening speaker, Erica Chenoweth. Today, few scholars of war realize that in the first half of the 20th century, a mathematician named Lewis Fry Richardson adapted methods for the analysis of weather to the analysis of war with astonishing results. In works that were eventually collected into the volumes Arms and Insecurity, 1949, and The Statistics of Deadly Quarrels of 1950, Richardson anticipated, codified, and dispatched with two problems that would preoccupy the emerging field of international relations theory quite some time before the field itself turned attention to and worked through the same problems. The first is what is commonly referred to as the security dilemma, or the paradox that states own efforts to maximize their, their own security contributes to actual insecurity. And the second is the attendant question of arms races. Richardson anticipated and modeled the problems associated with these phenomena before they'd gotten their contemporary names. This in an effort to show how prevailing logics about defending peace by preparing for war had actually led to disastrous effects in Europe. Similarly, in an era of strategic bipolarity that we commonly refer to as the Cold War, the scholar Anatole Rappaport studied what is commonly referred to as the prisoner's dilemma. This is a species of game that many deterrence theorists believe to explain the available strategic choices of the US and the Soviet Union during, in a context of mutually assured destruction. Reviewing such zero-sum non-cooperation games, Rappaport modeled their inadequacy to the kind of problems and opportunities that Cold War politics presented. So at a time when students of war were focusing on strategies, strategies of conflict they thought to be unavoidable and irreducible, Rappaport anticipated the crucial notion of complex interdependence that students of international politics would adopt as an important issue, if not always a norm, in their own thinking about peace and conflict in the international system. Since the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, the statistics on a certain kind of vi violence have been considerable 
of considerable concern to students of politics. The end of global bipolarity has led to the efflorescence of violent struggles, and these have challenged both the perceptions of and responses to old and seemingly new repertoires of politics. With respect to these conflicts, it's important to note that really since the 1990s, we've witnessed the outbreak of not a large number of conflicts, Iraq, Somalia, Yugoslavia, Haiti, Rwanda, Algeria, Sierra Leone, Kosovo, Chechnya, East Timor, to name just a few, and these loom very large. Characterized by intrastate violence and or anti-regime resistance campaigns, the contemporary history of conflict has largely been subsumed within debates about the character of what we now call new wars. Intervening in such assessments, Erica Chenoweth and her co-author, Maria Stefan, have carefully modeled what many other students of contemporary, pol contemporary political events simply failed to look at, at least until the events in Cairo in 2011. And that is that the strategic nonviolent conflict has been a significant feature of the new anti-regime campaigns, and that these have, by and large, been far more successful than their violent counterparts. In modeling the relative success rates of violent versus nonviolent insurgencies, Chenoweth and Stefan continue on the heels of previous studies on the strategic logic of nonviolent action, including the famous works of Gene Sharp and also of Colgate alumnus Peter Ackerman. But their singular contribution to debates about and scholarship concerning the political present originates in the case they make for the efficacy of nonviolent insurgencies. What the academic study of peace and security will do with this challenge, we have yet to see. But that it has taken notice is absolutely certain. Erica Chenoweth is an associate professor at the Joseph Korbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver, and is an associate senior researcher at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, PRIO. Together with Maria Stefan, she has the winner of the 2013 Gravmeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order, which is presented annually in recognition of outstanding proposals for creating a more just and peaceful world order. Their book, Why Civil Resistance Works, which is the basis for this evening's talk, also won the 2012 Woodrow Wilson Foundation Award given annually by the American Political Science Association in recognition of the best book on government, politics, or international affairs published in the US in the previous calendar year. So please join me in welcoming Erica Chenoweth. Well, thanks everybody for coming and thank you for the amazing hospitality uh, that you've shown me uh, the past couple of days and I'm sure that will extend through tomorrow. I'm absolutely delighted to be giving the memorial lecture in honor of Peter Scherer, who sounds like somebody that I would have really gotten along with. Um, and so I'm really grateful to, to be honored with that. And uh, I also wanna thank you for that really kind and comprehensive introduction uh, to this material and just note that you know, beyond Peter Scherer, there have been um, many other people uh, from Colgate or affiliated in some way with Colgate who have been influences of mine. Uh, Peter Ackerman certainly is one of them. Uh, his, uh, after he left Colgate, he went and got a PhD at the Fletcher School and wrote his dissertation on the strategic logic of nonviolent conflict. He used case study approach and, and worked out a lot of the problems uh, with his supervisor, Tom Schelling, that formed some of the theory behind our book. Uh, and uh, even earlier than that was, uh, I think, I think Johan, or not Johan Galton, but um, uh, Kenneth Boulding, actually. I think it, his first job was here at, at uh, Colgate. And he, if many of you may know, is a, is a very well-known Quaker uh, pacifist who, who passed away in the 90s, I think. But uh, one of my favorite Kenneth Boulding quotes, I'll, I'll just give it to you now, is, what exists is possible. And uh, his, his argument was that if we observe masses of, of, of people doing things peacefully, it's then possible to do that. Uh, if we see it, 
it's possible. <coughs> so I want to talk to you a little bit about um, my research today with Maria, and I'm going to first tell you where I was when I started this research. So back in 2006, I was finishing my doctoral dissertation in political science. Uh, the topic was why terrorism happens so much in democratic countries. I was swept up with the post 9-11 uh, intellectual environment of trying to understand better why people do stuff uh, violently. Uh, and I was hyper concerned with all things political violence, lethal objects flying through the air, things exploding, um, people uh, killing other people for political uh, motivations and, and so forth. And that really preoccupied me. And in June of 2006, I got this email from uh, one of my colleagues uh, and it, the, the subject line just said, the other side of the coin. And I opened the email and it was an invitation to a workshop called People, Power, and Pedagogy that was being put on at Colorado College, which was like about two hours away from where I was finishing up my thesis. And it was a week-long primer put on by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, uh, which is an edu educational foundation uh, to promote ideas about civil resistance. And they were trying to get people like me to pay attention to the material and to maybe teach about it in our classrooms if we found it persuasive. So uh, I applied in large part because they made mention of free books, um, free food and you know, uh, free room and board in this really nice uh, college in Colorado Springs. And so I, I was a graduate student. I, still today, actually, uh, free food will, will pull me out uh, and, and, and motivate me to apply for something. And I, uh, I went to this workshop and they sent this box of books in advance by people like Peter Ackerman and Gene Sharp, Jack Duvall, Steven Zunis, Kurt Schock, and a few other people. And they were making the claim that nonviolent or civil resistance, where unarmed civilians rise up using a variety of tactics like protests, boycotts, strikes, demonstrations, stayaways, and a coordinated sequence, could be more powerful and more effective in confronting oppressive opponents than armed struggle. So my view of all of this stuff at that time was that it was probably well-intentioned but dangerously naive. Uh, and I maybe even bordering on irresponsible to make this kind of argument. And I went into the workshop, guns a-blazing, uh, ready to sort of take down every argument using my, you know, uh, superior sense of, of intellect or whatever it was that I thought I had. And um, what I'm going to say is that these were the major concerns or reservations that I had that I'm calling common claims on this slide because I hear them all the time, repeated by other people. So the first reservation that I had was that if you're really facing down a truly repressive authoritarian opponent, unarmed civilians can't do anything. I mean, if they go out there and they try to confront an opponent that is willing and capable of using massive amounts of violence against them, there's just nothing they can do. Uh, so we shouldn't expect nonviolent resistance to work generally against very repressive, very militarily powerful, and very authoritarian opponents. The second thing that I thought was that nonviolent resistance probably can't work to get really hard stuff. So it might work if what you're after is some kind of policy reform. Uh, say you're interested in promoting gender rights or uh, racial justice or environmental reform uh, or something along those lines. But if you are literally trying to topple an existing incumbent government or you're trying to create territorial independence or secession, for example, that these are the types of goals or outcomes that we only really associate with violent struggle. So my sense was, you know, these exceptions like Serbia, the Philippines, and so forth were probably exceptions rather than the rule. You're generally not going to see people power movements removing entrenched authoritarians. And then the third thing that was on my mind was a function of the intellectual environment at the time. And Dan made reference to this, the sort of preoccupation with violence and the assumption that because we see so much violence, it must be for a good reason. Um, and, and there was a, a really influential article that came out in 2006 by a guy named Max Abrams called Why Terrorism Does Not Work. And what Max did was he rounded up a list of kind of the major terrorist organizations that the U.S. State Department had identified as such. And he asked how many of these have actually succeeded in achieving their goals. And he found that only 
of their goals had been achieved. So he's making the claim that terrorism is a, a very coercively ineffective method of struggle. But on the last page, he is bothered by this question of, if it's so ineffective, why is it happening so much? And he speculates at that point that at even 7% success, it's probably more effective in those cases than nonviolent resistance might have been. And he speculates that. So the intellectual environment that I came to this material in expects that nonviolent resistance is going to work less than 7% of the time. And, and so uh, that's, that's how I kind of uh, generated my, my arguments. So I'm sitting there in the back of the room and I'm carrying on these, you know, every time they're saying, well, you know, Milosevic was brought down by a people power movement in 2000, I'd raise my hand and say, yeah, but I can think of plenty of cases where violent resistance would have done the same thing or worked pretty well. And I can think of plenty of cases where nonviolent resistance has failed. So uh, Maria Stefan, who at the time was the educational coordinator for ICNC, uh, kind of came up to me and, and said, you know, you actually have a lot of valid concerns, but do you have the empirical data to back it up? And I said, no, I, you know, and, and she said, well, if you're right, why how would you prove it? How would you find out whether nonviolent resistance works better than violent resistance? And so we sat down together and I drew out what I thought would be a reasonable research design and um, we decided to, to go through it and see who was right. Um, and basically uh, what this involved was starting out by looking at the historical record of violent and nonviolent struggle. And by historical record, I mean back to 1900 and going through 2006 when we initiated this study. And we wanted to look globally, so every country in the world uh, and kind of during every time period we could find out about. And we ended up going to the correlates of war data set. Who's heard of the correlates of war data set? Okay, so if you wanna know whether there's been a war since like 1500, you can go to the correlates of war data set and somebody has counted it. Um, they've counted how many people died, what kind of war it was, what the outcome was, who it was between, and so forth. And what I did was I just took all of the violent intrastate conflicts, so that's between non-state actors and a state, either for the removal of the incumbent government or territorial independence, so that's anti-colonial and secession struggles. And uh, we only used the ones that were in this database, which are constituting cases where there are at least a thousand battle deaths, so they're large-scale conflicts. And so then um, we set those aside and I looked for the correlates of nonviolent conflict data set. And none of you have heard of it because it didn't exist. So we had to build that one from scratch and it took two years to sift through all kinds of data, resources, archival material, news reports, expert analyses, historians, case studies and the like to find data on mass nonviolent campaigns that were of a similar level of maturity in the sense that they already had at least a thousand observed participants and they were uh, anti-government explicitly. They were trying to overthrow the sitting government or they were trying to create territorial independence, just like the violent campaigns. So we excluded like civil rights, uh, racial justice, environmental reform, gender rights, because I was skeptical and said, we need to look at the hardest types of, of goals and only then will I be convinced. So we looked at, um, as I said, anti-dictator and, and territorial independence campaigns. So after about two years, we got the preliminary list. Uh, we then circulated the list around to about a dozen experts to find out whether we had left anything out, uh, any notable cases that I somehow didn't come across in the research. Um, and also to help us evaluate the degree to which these campaigns were successful. Now, the way we defined success was again using a very strict criteria. What we did was we decided that we would only focus on whether the campaign achieved all of what it said it wanted in terms of literally kicking out a ruling government or uh, kicking out a foreign military occupation or becoming 100% independent. So territorial autonomy, for example, doesn't count as full success. Um, and neither does holding free and fair elections uh, that then vote the dictator out of office. We only look at like a coercive removal of, of the authorities. And uh, we, we count this evenly across violent and nonviolent campaigns. We asked our panel of experts to assess, you know, whether we were correct or not in the way that we associated these outcomes. And 
we only looked at uh, successes in terms of you could make a really good judgment call that the campaigns had a direct impact on that outcome. So, for instance, if a, a leader died of a heart attack um, and, was, and, and that's how they left office, we didn't count that as a successful movement. Although they may, to their credit, have had something to do with that. <laughs> um, but, but in fact, uh, we wanted to really not give critics uh, ammunition to shoot down the argument by making these kind of great cases um, in one, one category or the other. So ultimately, uh, we came up with, after about a two-year process, a data set that I'm actually quite comfortable defending at this point as a very good representation of the universe of cases from 1900 to 2006 of mass nonviolent and violent campaigns of, of this character. And that constitutes 323 cases over the entire series. And then we analyzed the results, and they blew my mind. Uh, for one thing, uh, during this entire time period, nonviolent campaigns have succeeded twice as often as violent campaigns, and they've also achieved partial success, that's territorial autonomy or forcing a dictator to hold elections, uh, twice as often as violent campaigns. And the violent campaigns have failed more than twice as often outright. Um, another very striking thing that we found is that this trend has been increasing over time, such that in the past 40 years, nonviolent campaigns are becoming both increasingly frequent and increasingly successful, whereas violent insurgencies are becoming increasingly rare and increasingly unsuccessful. So I was wrong, and uh, for me, this was puzzling. And the big question is, why is nonviolent resistance outperforming violent resistance by such a dramatic effect? And uh, essentially, when we drilled down into the data further, we found that the answer lies in people power itself that the power of nonviolent conflict inheres and the ability of nonviolent campaigns to solicit diverse and mass support from various different actors in the society, and that that ability to get women, the elderly, people with disabilities, children, men, racial minorities, and others involved in the same movement gives them various points of leverage that allows them to pull away on the regime's sources of power in a way that gives them kind of unmatched uh, potential for reshaping their systems. So let me first establish this notion that the number of people that participate in a movement matters. So this is a graph that's produced by um, predicting the uh, pr probability of full success, so just those in full successful campaigns, um, by how many people are participating in the campaign. Now this bottom uh, metric right here, you can't really interpret straightforwardly because it's in a logarithmic scale. But essentially what it's saying with the slope of the association here is that the more people per population are participating in the campaign, the higher the probability the campaign will succeed outright. And in fact, um, here's a number that's gonna totally blow your mind. No campaign in our data set that mobilized 3.5% of the population or higher failed. So it's actually not, a, you know, a lot of people think you have to have like 50% of the population out there doing stuff, 3.5% of the population. Now, uh, there's a political scientist named Mark Lickbach who um, wrote a really great book called The Rebel's Dilemma back in, I think, 1995. And in it, he uh, uses a game theoretical model to establish that uh, there's what he calls the 5% rule, that uh, basically what you need is 5% of the population, and no government can sort of withstand a challenge of that size. We find that the threshold might actually be lower based on the empirical uh, data here. And get this, every <coughs> campaign that has achieved that 3.5% threshold has been a nonviolent one. So, in fact, nonviolent campaigns are on average 11 times larger than the average violent campaign in terms of the number of people who are participating per population. So, why would that be? Basically, um, we say that there are four major reasons, or lower barriers to participation, essentially, in a nonviolent <coughs> campaign. The first one is a lower physical barrier. So I can just tell you from my own experience uh, that doing any type of organized armed activity uh, puts some physical demands on people. And this makes it a little exclusive. 
When I was in college at the University of Dayton, I enrolled in military science classes with the intention of going through the ROTC program and becoming an Army officer. And I was like super into the rappelling and the shooting at the range and the uniforms and kind of the, you know, the whole uh, spirit around that. But um, I really hated getting up at four in the morning to run until I vomited. I'm, I'm sure some of you might be able to relate. Um, those of you who actually do that on a regular basis are much more committed than I am. And uh, so I quit, actually, and, and became a professor instead. Just <laughs> typical. Um, but, but basically, the, the point I'm making here is uh, not really this trivial. It's that uh, when someone is actually joining into organized armed activity, they are going to make some physical sacrifices. They're going to take physical risks, even during the preparation phase of the activity, uh, in a way that uh, makes what they're doing uh, more difficult for people with physical limitations to involve themselves in. Now, nonviolent campaigns have such um, a diverse array of tactics available to them that people can actually engage in nonviolent resistance without even moving from their couch. And that means that, uh, you know, if, if, if a few hundred thousand people don't get off their couch for a day, that can cripple the economy of, uh, of a town. And uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, uh, a lot of people seem content to sit on their couch for a few days and play Xbox. Um, and if it's political, then all the better to them. So um, the second lower barrier to, to participation is actually a lower commitment barrier. And by this, I don't mean a lower commitment to the cause. Oftentimes, uh, the people who engage in this type of activity are hyper committed to their cause. Of course, they're taking costly, risky action. But I mean that there are higher barriers to entry into an armed group and higher barriers to exit from an armed group. So let's say you're um, going to do some kind of organized armed activity that's going to require you to kind of be away from your family for a while. You're going to have to give up your job for a while. Um, you don't know, you know how, the, how the thing is going to go, but you know you're taking a lot of risks. And it makes people think twice, three times, four times, five times before they become fully entered into these types of groups. Um, and then once they're in, it's often very difficult for them to return to normal life. That's the, the main reason why people have such difficulty with demobilization and de-radicalization programs, if you want to call them that, uh, is because there is a, there's a, a certain lifestyle or set of expectations that come along with this type of committed activity that make it very difficult to re-enter into a society afterward. For a nonviolent campaign, you can have as many casual insurgents as you want. Uh, people don't actually have to give up their day jobs to participate often. They can just go after work, um, and that actually is a source of the popular numbers that can often back these types of tactics. There's also lower informational barriers for nonviolent campaigns. So let's say that you're in your apartment. You live in a very repressive country, and you come home from school or work one night, and you're sitting in there and your trusted neighbor comes to you and says, we're going to have a demonstration down the street tonight at 8 o'clock. Here's a little handout that gives you the escape route for when the police come. Um, but I really hope that you can make it. And I know that you're, you're kind of supporting us, but you're not quite sure whether you want to engage in this. But it's a people power demonstration. You'll be fine. So if you're like me, I've already kind of told you a little bit about my risk level. Um, I'm not going to be the person who's going to show up at 7.55. That's just me. I'm probably going to wait until I see how many people look to be showing up there in the square. So I'll look out my window. If I see six people down there in the main square, I'm going to sit this one out. Um, if I see 6,000 people down there in the square and I see more coming down the alleyway, uh, that's going to kind of activate a process in my mind that tells me that there's safety in numbers and that I can participate in this without being at very high risk of having myself hurt in the process. And, um, the, the point here is that there are a lot of tactics that are civil resistance tactics that are highly visible and that kind of create that even optical illusion sometimes that there are so many people out there that I can also join in. And it has this kind of um, uh, self-fulfilling effect on the number of people that participate. Armed groups have an information problem uh, where everybody kind of knows that they're overrepresenting how big they are. And the only way they represent their size is by doing armed actions. And so when they're doing the armed actions, I see something explode, and it's causing a lot of casualties. But that still doesn't tell me whether it's six people, 60 people, or 6,000 people behind it. And I won't know 
until I show up at the, the, you know, the warehouse and give the secret handshake how many people there are. I know how many people there are if I look out my window and see um, you know, a, a, a mobilization tactic like a demonstration. The final lower barrier to participation is a lower cognitive barrier. And by this, what uh, in the book we call it a lower moral barrier, but I'm increasingly thinking that it has to do more with cognitive processes. And uh, all this deals with is essentially the idea that, um, you know, when uh, that that people actually seem to be fairly resistant to engaging in offensive, violent action, especially lethal action toward other people. Um, and the proof that we have for this is that. Um, there, there have been lots of studies on military psychological analyses of trying to get troops, especially uh, draft soldiers, uh, to do offensive violence without, say, discharging the weapon into the air or hesitating on the battlefield to kill or uh, doing all sorts of things like foot dragging so that they don't have to actually show up to the field of battle. And militaries have been hyper-concerned with this problem for hundreds of years and have to go to lengths to try to train people out of their hesitation to kill. Now, not everybody hesitates to kill equally, um, but a lot of people do, and so they have to undergo certain kind of processes to break down that hesitation. Um, now, it can be done, militaries do it, but nonviolent campaigns don't even have to worry about it. Uh, so it, they don't have to confront this, this uh, cognitive hesitation uh, to engage in killing. So um, why does participation matter for civil resistance? Uh, to understand this, we kind of go back to Gene Sharp's theory about nonviolent action, where he starts out from the basic assumption that there's no such thing as a truly invincible, monolithic power holder. That in fact, no regime, no tyrant, no government of any form <laughs> is monolithic. And there are sources of power are based on the ability for them to compel the voluntary obedience of those they rule. So in fact, if a power holder has to deploy its army to try to quell an uprising, it's displaying its weakness. Because in order to get those people to cooperate, it has to use violence. It's much stronger, uh, paradoxically, the less it has to use violence to get people to obey. He also makes the argument that um, the lack of monolithic opponents means that every power holder is 100% dependent at all times on the cooperation, obedience, and help of people that reside in the so-called pillars of support. And those pillars are things like the security forces, economic elites, civilian bureaucrats, state media, religious authorities, educational elites, people in the society whose obedience, cooperation, and help keep that power holder uh, where he or she is. And so the strategy of civil resistance and the massing of, of people power is to simply leverage the relationships that people have already in society to pull those pillars of support away from the power holder. Now they don't necessarily do this by converting them. Uh, in fact, I think conversion is often lost on these pillars of support, but they do it by raising the costs of continuing to support the power holder. Let me make this a little more concrete. Let's say that uh, you're a general uh, in a one party system. There's one ruling party in your country and you have done well. And so you've been rewarded with the generalship. And your wife is uh, the president of a university, the state flagship university, because she's been a very good party member as well. And you are sort of like elites in this system. Now let's say uh, that there is a student movement that develops on that campus illegally, and they start to have these demonstrations in the main square. Now you get the order from on high to end it, just stop, stop those and don't let them get any bigger than they already are. And so you make your phone call as the general to your subordinates and say, go out and take care of that student movement. Now let's say that they are either incompetent or they simply go too far and they kill a couple of students in the square, and it's caught on you know, some kind of camera, and then all of a sudden you, to your dismay, are watching the TV and you see this media person with a microphone in front of your wife's mouth saying, what's the meaning of this? Violence on this campus. And your wife is kind of caught off guard and she has to try to explain herself out of it without making everybody on top angry, but also you know, trying to 
lower the political effects of this and kind of put it, put it away. Now, how many people are married? Okay, so you understand, I mean, you understand that uh, when you go home that night, it's gonna be rough at home, right? Um, and it's not, it, notice that the, the, the general and his, his wife aren't converted to the student's side, but there's gonna be some discomfort in the home. And uh, this discomfort in the home might end up looking like something like the general decides to do something to try to patch things up here because it was humiliating and awful and, and he's tired of you know, the silent treatment for three days and so says, you know what, um, I'm just gonna call in sick to work today. I'm just not going in today. Why don't we take a day off? And then uh, his, his wife says, well, that's not really enough. And, and he says, fine, I'm gonna call three of my subordinates and tell them not to show up either. And so, you know, four people in a fairly high level of the military calling in sick all at once looks a little interesting. It signals to other people in the military who maybe weren't so happy about what happened that maybe they can call in sick to work. And then all of a sudden, you have mass civil disobedience. People inadvertently joining in to the campaign just because it's costly for them not to. So again, it's not like melting their hearts. They're not joining the campaign because they want to. They're, uh, it's just too personally uncomfortable for them to not step aside. So uh, that's the theory. And uh, Maria and I wanted to see if that was right. And so we did uh, take a look at the probability that security forces would step aside, that is disobey orders, um, not cooperate with orders to repress or completely defect to the other side um, when people power increased. And very interestingly, what we found is that for violent campaigns, you can see that as the number of participants increases, the probability that security forces defect also increases, but the increase is slight. So it, it never really gets above around 25%, a one in four chance among the largest campaigns to get security forces to defect. For nonviolent campaigns, though, check out the effect of the increase of participants on the probabilities that security forces defect. In the largest campaigns, it's doubling in probability um, compared to the smaller campaigns. And um, the number that are defecting among the sort of average size nonviolent campaigns are like twice as much as the average violent campaigns. So what about repression? Because, yeah, I mean, sometimes these crackdowns do happen. In fact, in almost every one of the nonviolent campaigns that we looked at, the unarmed civilian faced massive violent repression. So the question is, uh, can they succeed under those conditions? Um, it does reduce the chances of success for them. We don't want to have any illusions about that. But even under those types of conditions, the nonviolent campaigns are still outperforming the violent ones by two to one. So why is it still more successful even under these conditions? We think there are two reasons. The first is that it seems like repression like this against nonviolent campaigns is more likely to backfire. Backfire is a process that a scholar named Brian Martin uh, has identified in his book called Justice Ignited, The Dynamics of Backfire. And what he says is that backfire is when the intended effect of your repression, uh, basically the opposite happens. So it's totally counterproductive and, and worse, it, the, the situation you were trying to put down gets even worse. And he says that in order for backfire to occur, a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition, but a necessary condition is moral outrage. So repression has to produce moral outrage. And what we seem to be finding is that that moral outrage is more likely to happen when the repression appears to be excessive, disproportionate, and unjust. <coughs> and that that seems to happen more when the objects of the repression are unarmed civilians. Now, we're definitely not arguing that unarmed civilians should go out and provoke this type of repression because that's always a huge risk, and it does decrease, on average, their chances of success relative to those that don't face that type of repression. But what we do find is that repression doesn't necessarily doom the campaigns, and the reason is because of the unsustainability of that repression when the campaigns skillfully shift between so-called tactics of concentration, where people come to a particular space and concentrate into that space and, and create mass, and what we call tactics of dispersion. That's when people stay away from places they were expected to go. They, they, they do the sit on the couch demonstration, otherwise known as a stay at home. 
they bang on pots and pans to signal that their size is ever increasing in spite of the repression. Um, and these are very difficult tactics to repress. So here's an example from the Iranian Revolution, the one from 1977 to 79. Now in the, the last phase of this, they called it the 100 Days Revolution. This is the one against the Shah. Um, and they called it the 100 Days Revolution because the, the really mass episodes of it uh, were occurring during the last 100 days or so before he left office. The first 90 or so days were demonstrations, tactics of concentration, where people were coming in doing rallies. They were repressed. There were thousands of people killed during this period in the streets. Um, and they would then have funeral processions where more people would come out and march uh, to commemorate the people who were killed the day before. But this was becoming pretty risky and pretty predictable. You know, over time, you know, the, the, the opponent regime can simply outmaneuver these types of, of actions. So what happened is then in the last 10 or so days, the campaign got the oil workers to strike. And the oil workers were more in the countryside, and they um, went on this strike and they did a stay-at-home demonstration with it, rather than a picket line. So basically, the security forces had to go out door to door, individually, pulling the oil workers back out onto the streets, marching them down to the streets, to the oil fields, where they then worked at half pace. Now, it's really hard to do something with workers working at half pace, because if you kill them, then they just stop working. <laughs> um, and it's really hard to uh, beat them up and expect them to work faster. So they couldn't do much about that. And the next day, the oil workers stayed at home. The security forces went out door to door, marched them down the street to the oil fields where they work at half pace. Now, after about four or five days of this, guess who started calling in sick to work? The security forces. Why? Because they made a calculation that I'm supposed to get overtime for this. And because these oil workers are only working at half pace, the oil revenues next month aren't going to be enough to pay me my overtime. And I'm not going to do this for free. It's too uncomfortable. I have to go, my kids go to school with those people's kids. Like, it's gonna be too difficult, the Shah's over, and I'm not gonna live in that society where I'm gonna be, you know, routed for this. Now, one of the interesting things is that the Shah's regime actually had enough revenues to pay them their overtime. They had plenty of money in the reserves and foreign backing from the United States, among other places. But the security forces didn't need to know that, right? Um, they fell for it, and, and that was the end of the Shah. He left the country within a week. Okay, so what about foreign state support? I just mentioned that uh, the Shah of Iran had the support of the United States and it didn't save him. Um, <clears throat> what about the, the issue of uh, supporting a nonviolent campaign? Well, we looked at this and we looked at it in a narrow sense of just looking at direct, overt state material support for a campaign. And we found that nonviolent campaigns are far less likely actually to get state support in the first place, maybe because they go unnoticed or because states think that they're not the winning horse. Either way, when they did get some kind of external state support, it didn't actually increase their chances of success on average. Why? Because their power comes from people power. And if you're the leader of a movement, and nine months into it, you have to explain to the people that have been following you that you actually are getting funds from a foreign government, uh, then you might be in trouble of living, losing your legitimacy. Violent campaigns, on the other hand, it's, they're, they're much more likely to get foreign backing from a state in terms of guns, sanctuary, or money, and it's actually the one thing that increases their chances of success. They can't always rely on the same numbers, as I've mentioned, in terms of their popular supporters from within the country, and so they have to essentially buy or coerce obedience, um, and that requires them to increase their capacity through state support. It increases their chances by about 15%. So what happens when they win then? Uh, well, Maria and I wanted to look at cases where you know, insurgent groups had actually been victorious. And we wanted to look at what those societies looked like afterward compared to societies where nonviolent campaigns worked. Um, so it, we want to be very clear that we never say that violence doesn't succeed. In fact, 25% of the cases, you see violence succeeding, essentially. And you can probably think of examples off the top of your head. Um, but the question is, when, it ha when they do succeed, what is the cost in the long term for these societies? So one uh, cost that we didn't look at in the book, but that I'm going to mention right now, is the death toll itself. So um, 
there's this great book written by a guy named Ben Valentino called Final Solutions, Mass Atrocities and Genocide in the 20th Century. It's kind of a, it's kind of a brutal read, but it's a terrific book, and I highly recommend it. But in his book, what Valentino is trying to do is understand the sources of mass killings in the 20th century. Um, because there's kind of a view out there that the, the only governments that really do these mass killings toward their populations are either hyper-nationalistic or hyper-ideological. And what he argues is actually that what's happening is that the majority of incidents or episodes of mass killing, where there were at least 10,000 civilians killed, were not of those kind of hyper-ideological um, or racist regimes, they were in counter-guerrilla campaigns, that is scorched earth counterinsurgency campaigns. And so um, th there's just many episodes over the, the course of the 20th century of this type of, of mass killing, and in fact, you know, the Syrian case, the, the tragic case of Syria shows this exactly, um, that as soon as the armed struggle component sets on, uh, regimes that feel like they're up against a wall often engaged in these types of scorched earth tactics uh, toward civilian populations um, in a, an effort to do what they call draining the swamp. Um, in terms of the um, level of democracy, what we did was we took a look at just five years after the campaign had ended, what do these countries look like? Now this is another one of those slides that people are like, Erica, why do you, why do you put this slide up here? I can't read what this says. Um, what this is down here is this is a scale negative 10 to plus 10. Now that's the 21 point polity scale. Has anybody heard of the polity scale? Um, what it is, is it's a 21 point scale that identifies the level of uh, procedural democracy that exists in a country. By procedural democracy, I mean that there are uh, institutions that allow for competitive elections. Uh, there is really very little uh, legal restriction on who can participate in elections and that the, uh, there is a separation of, of powers. There's checks and balances built into the government um, that constrain the executive in terms of what they can do independently of other uh, branches of government. So um, it's a pretty narrow definition of democracy, but a lot of uh, political scientists would consider it kind of necessary features of what then might develop into a more cultural kind of democracy. So um, we certainly wouldn't argue that democracy is, you know, that some kind of some cure-all or anything for a lot of the problems in these societies, but given that many of them were anti-dictator campaigns or they were trying to create a new country, um, you know, the fact that uh, many of them wound up democracies was of concern to us uh, as opposed to what they could have been otherwise. So what we're looking at here is the level of democracy in the country a year before the campaign ends. So what is it when the campaign is fighting? And then what we're looking at the vertical axis is the probability that the country is a democracy that's a plus six or higher on that polity scale five years after the campaign ends. Now that's a pretty short term um, because most political scientists say it takes like 15 to 20 years for consolidation to occur, so it's strict. But what we find actually is this striking impl influence of nonviolent methods of struggle on the probability that a country will either become a democracy or stay a democracy. Uh, five years after the campaign ends. And if you think about it, has anybody heard of Robert Putnam's book, uh, Bowling Alone? Okay, There's, he, he wrote another book that was like an academic version of this called Making Democracy Work, where he like lived in a villa in Tuscany for two years and studied Italian democracy. Smart political scientist. And he, what he was doing is he was comparing the quality of democracy in Northern Italy and Southern Italy. And he was making the claim that Northern Italy was a much more robust and responsive democracy because of what he calls social capital that was very uh, predominant in Northern Italy. And by social capital, he just means a very robust associational life. Meaning people get in rooms like this that we're in tonight and talk about politics, about what's going on in their communities, in their neighborhoods. They hold their representatives to account directly. Um, they read the papers, they're highly engaged. They do church groups, they have bowling leagues, hence the Bowling Alone book. Um, they do sports, they're, they're just, the civic associational life is very robust and that leads people to be more engaged in their political life. And in Southern Italy, he says that's not happening the same way. The, the sort of associational life is the church or the mafia. So um, if you think about it, uh, civil resistance, where people are basically engaging in uh, a highly experimental grassroots 
consensus-oriented, cooperative collective action is like social capital, but it's on steroids because people are building it from the ground up. And so if you buy the argument that social capital actually does help democracy work, then civil resistance ought to do the same thing. And the converse is that uh, the way that you fight determines the way that you rule. So if you're an armed group and your group is kind of elite oriented, it's a vanguard of uh, highly ideological uh, people that are trying to maintain discipline through martial values, then it's highly likely that that kind of mode of governance will be uh, reproduced when the insurgents win. Um, we also look at the probability that the country will relapse into civil war 10 years after the campaign is over, within 10 years. And we find that uh, campaign, countries in which there has been a nonviolent campaign are 15% less likely to relapse into civil war whereas countries in which there was an armed insurgency are 15% uh, more likely to relapse into civil war, perhaps because they deposed the incumbents violently and didn't disarm them. So what's the point of all of this? Well, I'll mention a couple of things that, um, as I mentioned, the, the, these results for me initially were mind-blowing and now make total intuitive sense. Um, and I want to point out what I think are a couple of areas that are kind of big ideas, areas that... Uh, point to some scholarship we should all be paying more attention to. The first is our notion of power. So I was really one of those people that bought into the idea that power flows from the barrel of a gun. The sort of Weberian sense that one of the key components of statehood is the monopoly on the, the use of force, the legitimate use of force. And so, um, yeah, I was one of those people that thought that if a state is deploying its force toward its own people, it's demonstrating its power, not its lack of power. And I think what this research does is it focuses much more on notions of power that emphasize consent and legitimacy. Um, and those are very difficult concepts to operationalize. It's very difficult to understand whether uh, and how we can measure and observe a government's legitimacy. But one potential way of doing that is by looking at how many people are willing to go out and take highly risky, highly costly action uh, to try to change it. So the second thing that I think uh, many of us ought to look more into is the role of civilians in conflict. So one of the things that Dan pointed out that is so right is that those of us who have studied conflict um, were often preoccupied with kind of the violent aspects of conflict, and you can understand why. Um, but the way that conflict has often been studied is in a dichotomous sense, where there's either violent conflict happening or nothing. But in fact, what we're looking at here is that there's all kinds of conflict happening when there's no violent conflict happening necessarily from the ground up. And that actually civilians aren't just victims of violence or resources to loot. <laughs> in fact, they can be active agents in affecting the course of events, even in violent conditions where they find living intolerable. And then the third thing that's really interesting to think about is this sort of agency structure divide. Now, I haven't talked much about it in this talk, but one of the key concerns of political scientists is the degree to which opponent institutions might mediate and moderate and affect the behavior of people that are rising up against it. And that they might, in a sense, predetermine, in a sense, the way that people fight. And we actually subjected that view to a host of tests and continue to and found no support for it. In other words, what we're finding is that people are actually choosing to use nonviolent resistance and that that choice itself is having some really profound effects on the outcomes of their struggles in both the short and the long term. So for those that are more interested in the policy implications of this, I think that there are plenty of those to look at as well. The first is the question of whom should, uh, you know, if you're the American government, whom do you support in a given conflict? Now, what our kind of research on the long-term implications of armed struggle suggests is that if you're a person who actually wants to help other countries be more at peace internally, um, who wants to see people determine what kind of govern government they have and, and who governs them, and uh, you want as few people to die in the process as possible, um, then it would seem to me that supporting armed groups is not a great way to get there, um, because that's what our research shows. So the question, though, is that can you actually support the alternative? Can you support 
civil resistance movements without completely interfering in their own domestic basis of legitimacy? And I think from a state-centric perspective, uh, the answer is we actually don't know yet uh, the degree to which states will actually hurt these movements more than help them by, by backing them. But what I can say is that um, if you buy the argument that better choices in terms of strategic choices made by civilians, a skill set that gives them the kind of forethought and knowledge that um, you know, two weeks of street demonstrations isn't going to do much, but if you come up with a three-year plan where you're kind of maneuvering around expected levels of government repression and coming up with very creative ways uh, to stay on the offensive rather than defensive, if you buy the argument that those types of skills are useful to civilians trying to make these choices under their given conditions, then it would stand to reason that sharing that knowledge uh, and putting them in touch with people who have had experience with these types of struggles in their own context might be also useful. And so I actually have a working hypothesis that civilian-led instruments, where people are talking to other people with past experience from their own context, can be highly useful uh, for these people. And so that suggests a totally different toolkit for our diplomatic corps. It suggests much more emphasis on things like civil society development, political capacity building among opposition groups, um, and especially grassroots movements, um, if that's something that uh, people think is uh, both ethical to do and uh, indicated for the, the given situation. So if you're gonna take anything away uh, from what I've just talked about, I'd say take away these three things. First of all, nonviolent resistance has a superior track record, apparently, of uh, achieving major change compared with violent insurgency in the 20th century, and there's no reason for us to expect that that trend won't continue. <laughs> Second of all, that this is true even in conditions where we would expect nonviolent resistance to fail uh, because of the unique dynamics of the ability of civil resistance movements to pull those pillars of support away from uh, you know, seemingly monolithic sources of power. And third, that the way that these campaigns uh, prosecute their struggle uh, and the method of struggle that they choose seems to reproduce itself and the country that comes along afterward. And so the choices that are made in the short term, even to achieve kind of short-term success, um, might also have really important implications for uh, people seeking of human rights, um, democratic governance, or relatively democratic governance, uh, and civil peace in, in the long run. So with that, um, I am absolutely eager to answer your questions, which I hope I'll do so enthusiastically. And here's the way to get in touch with me. So, 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 just to begin with the questions, I'd like to ask you to focus for just a moment on your own discipline, uh, because all of what you've presented is just, you know, related to a lot of material that we, we, we've come to understand and makes a great deal of sense. But the puzzle here is the persistent hegemonic logic of your discipline, which had you believing this other inverse position, mm -hmm. and, and it's a position that still remains normative. Yeah. So I'd like you to sort of focus for a second, if it's just a way of beginning the conversation on the status of knowledge mm -hmm. and its relation to power in political science mm -hmm. that would, how it works in such a way that makes the work you've done now have to be argued so persistently in order to be heard. Yeah, so this is actually, one of the most revealing things about uh, this whole process has been the like five minute 
caveating I have to do at the beginning of my talks for people to take it seriously. And by that, what I mean is by telling people I was a skeptic, I'm not a pacifist, you know, this and that, so I didn't have an ideological dog in the fight, yeah. and yet I found this. And what, what ends up being so fascinating about that is like, why do we have to do that, <laughs> right? So like, uh, the, and, and I think it comes back to a kind of issue we have about the quote unquote normal science uh, that we're supposed to do, which is that you're supposed to be some kind of objective, emotionless automaton who just, you know, gathers the data like a monkey and then looks at it and decides what you find out uh, is what you should say, um, which is, you know, just, it's increasingly um, uh, challenged, I think, and rightfully so, that that's the reality. And so, um, in terms of the status of knowledge today, I, I have a couple things to report. First of all, um, there is incredible interest in this topic now. Uh, since our book came out and since the Arab Spring happened and many other cases now are happening. Um, so that literally, I mean, the, the Peace Research Institute of Oslo is this massive uh, body of researchers who have in some way or the other had the market on the data production for armed conflict over the past 60 years or so. And they have closed down their center for the study of civil war and opened a new shop on nonviolent resistance. And that's what they want to do now. Um, and then you have people like Steve Walt and Bob Jervis and people like that blurbing our book, <laughs> saying that this is like some of the most important knowledge that we have and we should all run with it, you know? And these guys are realist thinkers. They would very much identify themselves with the realist school of thought in international relations. And so in a sense, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we're kind of undergoing this paradigm shift, but there's often going to be intense resistance to it. And I'm, I've recently been thinking, I, couldn't, I cannot believe I'm thinking about it, but I'm thinking about Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. I, I knew there was a reason they assigned us that book in graduate school. And um, basically what Kuhn argues is like, he's trying to answer this puzzle of why didn't people give up the Copernican model when the Galilean model came about? Like what, it, what was it that made people so resistant to the new ideas? And you know, they knew that there were all kinds of things that they couldn't understand from the Copernican model. Like the, the stars just didn't line up right, um, but they also didn't have another model that overcame all the problems that, uh, that other models like tried to project. So they all tried to explain it, but they weren't quite there because they had this fundamental assumption that everything rotated around the Earth, right? So then when Galileo comes and he says, look, there's a different model, you're gonna have to give up that Earth-centric assumption, but if you do and you focus on stuff rotating around the sun, not only do you understand a bunch of the puzzles that we couldn't get at, like the stuff that wasn't lining up with Copernicus, but we can understand way more than that. And that it took that and then him being, you know, put on trial for heresy and like all kinds of other stuff for people to actually wrap their minds around it and accept it. So my hope is now that we have, you know, on, on the basis of that research program, like empirical, defensible, strategic support for the notion, that people will stop being so resistant to this idea that violence is the only way to get something meaningful out of life. And, and you know, if, if I, I guess this sounds very bold, and I, I don't mean to sound like super arrogant about it, but, but I'm, I, I do think that the main problem of the sort of peace research body of work is that um, it was perceived so much in, in our field as normative only, normative only, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, per se, but that it, they were like speaking past each other uh, because there was a normative concern and then uh, there was like a strategic studies utilitarian concern and so they weren't meeting in the middle as much. Uh, so I'm hoping that people will see that now that we're trying to meet it in the middle uh, that they'll be more willing to take on the new material. So if I could just follow up for yeah. one second. The, the interesting part of what you've done is to, at some level, expose the utilitarian as normative. Yes. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering what the response is when you, mm -hmm. when you do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so it depends on who we talk to. Um, there, there are a lot of people that uh, we presented this work to and who said something kind of like what you said, which is, duh. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've known this for a long time. A lot of pacifists have said, I've known this all along, um, so you're not really revealing anything new. Uh, 
to us, um, but you're giving it empirical support or whatever. Um, and then, you know, there are people that are kind of more on the utilitarian uh, viewpoint who are sort of saying maybe there isn't anything wrong with kind of getting behind uh, a good idea <laughs> that actually helps people too. So I'm, I'm hoping that we just talk to each other more as, as uh, the field goes. And I think that's one thing that we've accomplished. Oh, thank you, Professor. Um, professor. Um, and forgive me if this is missing the point a little bit, but I think, um, do you think your, the model you're presenting here fits as well in, and for lack of a better word, a developing or third world area such as with the Arab Spring as it would maybe in a place such as the United States or a more developed place where you have the systems of government and whatnot are in, are more concrete and where the citizens maybe, uh, and you, you mentioned uh, like sitting on the couch where that may devolve into what I've heard referred to as slacktivism mm -hmm. where you know a thousand likes on Facebook for this cause or whatever. Do you think mm -hmm. th your model will translate as well into that, that, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, one of the paradoxes is that it, kind of in the, in, in what you're calling highly developed democracies or advanced democracies, um, the bar for what counts as disruptive civil disobedience is higher than it is in a lot of authoritarian systems. Because in this country, it's totally legal to protest. We have election rallies. Um, in some places, it's even legal to strike. <laughs> Increasingly fewer. Um, but, uh, but it's actually, you know, we, we have a variety of these tools that in many other countries are considered civil resistance. Uh, because they are so, they're illegal and they are highly disruptive and highly transgressive in that society. And so there's one paradox is that it's harder to actually do something that is really disrupting normal politics in a country where so much is legal. The second paradox is that people seem to be very satisfied in countries like ours with elections, right? So they're, they're comfortable with the institutional mechanisms for bringing about change. And one of the paradoxical results of that is that it's not hard to mobilize people to do protests and things, but it's hard to do a sustained campaign of disruptive civil disobedience tactics because it seems like, you know, getting, in, in this country, 3.5% of the population to be 11 million people. And it's hard to get 11 million people to do highly disruptive civil disobedience for, say, a year and a half, which is about as long as it might take for it to really have a cumulative effect. Uh, because they think, well, you know, by that time I can just go and vote that guy out of office, right? So um, there, there's kind of like a, an interesting problem uh, for civil resistance organizers in countries where people have faith in the electoral process um, and where, you know, in order for them to actually do something that will be noticed, they have to do some really disruptive stuff. I'm be interested in what your thoughts are in discussing implications for scholars. Mm -hmm. Both your book, your paper, and your presentation was totally silent on the arms industry mm -hmm. and the arms manufacturer mm -hmm. and the degree to which they play into the promotion of violent campaigns worldwide. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you and your colleagues have given some thought to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And um, the so the, the idea about the sort of military industrial complex and its um, influence on uh, promoting violence by states and also by private actors um, is a very interesting concern. Um, I'm very interested now in trying to understand how civil resistance works when it's directed at non-state targets, like corporations or certain industries. And, um, Nobody's collected systematic data on that yet, but we're working on it, and we'll be able to find out more about the impact on those types of opponents. Now, people like Gene Sharp have long said that, in fact, um, the kind of structure of power, where there's a power holder, there's a power center that relies on different pillars of support, is more or less a universal model, that it applies as much to corporations as it does to governments. And an example of this might be uh, the California farm workers strikes that were led by Cesar Chavez, uh, where you know, the, the main target there were basically grape farms. And the way that that movement was able to extract concessions around labor rights uh, from the grape farmers 
was literally by pulling on its pillars of support. And in this case, the ones that were the most uh, important were transportation workers who were refusing uh, to actually ship the grapes out to uh, their various um, distributors. And so, you know, any, any opponent should have different visible pillars that can be pulled away from it in terms of their loyalty. Um, and that, in that case, it was the Longshoremen's Union. But um, in the arms industry, you can imagine uh, different parts suppliers, consumers, uh, government subcontractors, um, the people who purchase the weapons, the people who distribute the weapons. I mean, there, there's a whole host of, of yeah, of, of pillars that actually they also rely on in order to stay in business. And so I know that there are a lot of um, activists who are peace activists out there who are very concerned with identifying what are the pillars that uh, an anti-war, anti-sort of military industrial complex might ha uh, have access to in this country. And they're, they're actually, they're really smart and they're working really hard on it. And I, I think that we'll, we'll find out more in the future. Hi, um, I was wondering um, if you would be willing to talk a little bit about um, personal changes that happened to you <coughs> in the course of moving from somebody who, um, at least the way you presented yourself, you sounded almost, I would say, pro-military mm -hmm. when you started, that you had the tendency mm -hmm. to put nonviolence and violence together mm -hmm. and not even think about that violence was destructive. You were just mm -hmm. looking at the two and if there was a chance mm -hmm. that violence would achieve, you, you allowed them to be equal. Mm -hmm. And now your, um, your presentation <coughs> is um, um, very soft for academia and I'm wondering if you think there's a chance that the changes in researchers that happen when you seize this kind of a paradigm shift um, could do some of the work that Dan was asking about originally, about the way the fields are constructed. And I guess part of my argument is that our fields in academia are constructed violently. In other words, in, in the ways that we don't um, privilege interdisciplinarity, we literally cut one another off. We cut off access to, I think, the kind of paradigm you discovered. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could speak to that a little. Sure. Um, so in, in terms of the, the sort of personal transformation, it's been really interesting. I mean, um, I, I, I am a person who, you know, just kind of came from a, I don't know, I guess a traditional kind of like uh, Southwest Ohio <laughs> kind of like uh, frame of mind. And I did buy into this idea that power flows from the barrel of a gun. I saw that reflected back to me and the way we learned about US history. You know, it's a chronology of battles. Um, that's, that's what we learned about. I, we got to Martin Luther King maybe in the last week of my AP history course, but it was an afterthought. We never talked about Gandhi. So, I mean, I think some of it comes from like how we, how we teach people about what matters, you know? Um, but, and, and I'm actually making a lot of efforts to try to help people come up with curricular initiatives that would make this accessible to people of all ages and all that stuff. Um, but in terms of the, um, the, the fields, the academic life, um, I do find that we're, we're in these silos. We have these disciplinary kind of traditions, uh, norms, ways of talking even to each other about things, ways of thinking about what counts as, you know, productive scholarship. I mean, there's a lot that's very separated across the disciplines. And even within my discipline, political science alone, um, we separate into so-called subfields. So you have international relations, that's the guns and bombs people. Um, we have comparative politics, that's the, the bleeding heart liberals. Then we have American politics, those are the people that really like counting congressional roll call. Um, <laughs> this is a whole different animal. Um, and then we have political theory. And we segregate the things that we study by those types of very arbitrary <laughs> distinctions. And so um, I can say that uh, the, the coolest thing about this whole project has been coming and doing things like this and listening to the questions people ask and learning so much more from the audience about like what's, you know, what makes people tick, uh, 
like their experiences on the ground, like all the anecdotes I got, I got from talking to people and audiences during Q and A's, right? Like, like I've learned so much about these dynamics. And there's this, um, there's a guy named Robert Inkowski, who I guess used to teach English or performance or something at uh, CSU Hayward or something like that, who, who had this amazing quote. He said, nonviolence is a wager, not so much on the goodness of humanity, but on its infinite complexity. And complexity is what this is all about. And in order to get at real complexity, we have to talk to people in other fields. We, you know, the, this is about people, like human beings doing stuff that's having this huge impact. And, um, and I can't understand people by sitting in my IR ivory tower. You know, like I have to talk to social psychologists. I was telling somebody like, I'm, I'm really into talking to psychologists right now. <laughs> Especially after talking to so many people um, you know, who've been out and doing this work and are damaged in many ways, they, they would say, from what's happened to them. And so it's really useful to, to talk to people like this about it. So yeah, I'm, my, I'm moving much more into an interdisciplinary way of thinking about things, and I encourage others to do the same. I just have a very quick question. Oh, yeah. Um, and it would be, um, uh, while listening to your presentation, I wondered um, to what extent that violence enacted against civil resistance groups helps the civil resistance group. And if you're in your data, you came up with any um, correlation between, you know, deaths or um, or casualties or any sort of um, injuries at the start of a nonviolent resistance, and then the increased effectiveness mm -hmm. of that, um, mm -hmm. the increased success. Yeah, it's a great question and. We didn't actually do casualty counts um, with the data that I put up here. Uh, I'm doing it now, and it's, it's difficult because there are all kinds of over-reporting and under-reporting biases in both directions. It's very difficult to be systematic about it, but we're working on it. And what I can tell you is that we have found some evidence um, that uh, nonviolent campaigns are more likely than violent campaigns to initiate the backfire process with regard to repression. But repression is bad <laughs> for, for both kinds of campaigns. It's highly dangerous. Um, sometimes campaigns are able to make the use of it, like good use of it, uh, to uh, develop a heightened awareness of the injustices that then appeal to a wider range of potential participants. Um, but that said, um, you know, neither Maria and I would ever argue that people should deliberately provoke uh, violent repression against especially the people that are they, they convinced to turn up to participate because it can actually put a movement into total disarray, especially the very savvy kinds of repression, you know, where it's, it's not as overt, but it's like surveillance and detention and disappearances and stuff like that, which, which I think is, um, is very dangerous for movements, uh, although they still can kind of bounce back in remarkable ways from it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think... Um, it's a mistake to take as an implication that we're saying people should go out and martyr themselves. Yeah, uh, and that's not what you asked, but I just want to say it so that it's on the video. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm having, still having a little trouble wrapping my, my mind around all the, this theoretical stuff, and I wonder if you could, uh, if you could take some couple examples from, perhaps from the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it just it would help me to talk in terms of examples that are are, are recent that yeah. kind of prove prove your point. Now, obviously, it's it it's not a statistically valid sample, but maybe mm -hmm. that would help me at least. You got it. So, so let's talk about um, just like three cases: Tunisia, um, uh, Libya, and and Syria. Um, so Tunisia. Here's a really interesting case. Um, the sort of noticing of Tunisia happened in December of 2010. That's when people really turned their attention to it because it looked like people were just like overwhelmingly hitting the streets. It was not spontaneous. It did not start in 2010 um, when Mohammed Bouazizi self-immolated. There were like 15 self-immolations in the previous year and a half that didn't trigger uh, this kind of mass demonstrations. But there had been uh, a number of labor strikes in the Gafsa area of Tunisia and, and in other places. So this was kind of building up over time and people were gaining experience about how to circumvent repression and so forth. And, and basically what happened is um, 
you know, when people did kind of engage in this sort of mass uprising, um, the, in, in Tunisia, it was like a textbook example of people in the streets doing mass demonstrations, more and more people joining in, directing uh, the, the efforts at the, the regime, saying Ben Ali must go. Um, and then security forces were shooting people. I mean, there were snipers, they were shooting people dead in the streets. Um, but then Ben Ali gave the order uh, to, I guess, his, um, some of his like, um, air battalions to go in and wipe out some of the protesters, and they refused. And so that was, that was the defection that we saw. Because, and and they're, they're refusing not because they're saying it's not morally right. They're refusing because they think this guy's number is up, and they're not going to go to the criminal courts and, and be the, the you know, they're not going to let themselves be put in jail when he falls or whatever. So they disobey. Um, and as soon as, as your upper level uh, military commanders are saying no to you, you're done, right? So he, he leaves the country. That's textbook nonviolent campaign, the dynamics of nonviolent action. Although the, the one really key implication um, to take from that isn't that it was like four weeks of street demonstrations. It was kind of a longer process. The reason I mention that is because Libya and Syria were cases where people maybe got the sense that two weeks of street demonstrations could bring down a dictator. So in Libya, you have people running out in the streets in February of 2011 going, we'll run out into the streets and Gaddafi will fall. And they were totally disorganized. It was kind of like a triggered event from Tunisia. Within two and a half days, it turned to armed rebellion. There were defections. In fact, a whole group of the military <laughs> defected and became the rebels, <laughs> um, kind of militia commander types. They, didn't, they brought their guns with them. That's one lesson we learned about the sort of right kind of defections <laughs> that you want for a campaign to stay nonviolent. Um, and, you know, sure enough, Qaddafi comes out and says, like, the people that have risen up against me with arms, I'm going to come door to door and, and hunt them down like rats. Well, that, you know, triggers the international community to think, well, we need to get behind these rebels, um, which they do. NATO comes in. There's an intervention. It lasts for a few months, and, and Qaddafi is completely routed, as he would be uh, with a rebellion that was supported by the international community. So that actually kind of proves our point that an armed struggle might be able to um, to work, but generally only if it gets kind of the international community behind it, right? Because, uh, and the reason the international community came in is because they foresaw that the rebels were going to get completely obliterated and that there was probably going to be some kind of nasty scorched earth campaign, which is debatable, but either way the rebels are going to lose, um, or it was going to be a long bloody thing like we see in Syria. Um, so then, in Syria, here's a really interesting case because you have a campaign that starts out as a, as a pretty disciplined, nonviolent campaign, but that is tragically uh, kind, of, uh, m kind of misled in its expectations from Tunisia and Egypt that street demonstrations on Fridays are going to be enough. And so um, this is actually starting more in the rural areas, not in Damascus. Um, and it starts in March of 2011. Nobody expected it. Um, people were like, Syria is the one place this is never going to spread. It happens. Um, and then uh, basically by July of 2011, having faced a, a high level of, of repression, a group of Sunni military leaders defect and go across the border into Turkey with their weapons, and Turkey gives them sanctuary. Now, at that point, you're going to have all kinds of regional <laughs> actors say, let's get behind these, these armed free Syrian army guys and give them more weapons, more money, and, and keep them safe so that they can launch a real struggle, right? <laughs> and so at that point, what you get is basically a nonviolent campaign that has really been actually making considerable gains with forcing defections and starting to become more active in the major cities, um, but is over-reliant on this single method of demonstrations. They tried to do strikes, a national strike. It didn't work. They didn't have enough people yet. Um, and um, they weren't able to maintain kind of re the resiliency in their participation rates because the repression against the demonstrations got too intense and they weren't able to shift into kind of more um, dispersed methods. The other thing that happened is that they never united. Um, the nonviolent opposition was always very divided over a couple of things. One was whether they should be using violence and the other was whether they should be inviting the international community to come in and support them. And because of that, they stayed highly fractious, and some of them ended up supporting the Free Syrian Army. And by December of 2011, 
I mean, Assad has been using this propaganda that these are terrorists and that it's a foreign conspiracy. And guess what? He's now facing a full-scale armed rebellion that's supported by international actors. So his military and his kind of Sunni supporters dig in their heels. And now we're into a terrible, tragic, bloody conflict where 5,000 plus people are being killed a month or a week even in some weeks. Um, and it exactly demonstrates the tragic outcomes of these types of, of choices. Um, so a lot of people have asked me, could it have been any different in Syria? I have no idea. But what I can tell you is that the average nonviolent campaign takes about three years to run its course. And that nonviolent campaign in Syria didn't have enough time for us to find out. So what could we have done differently? We might have been able to help coordinate defections so that the Free Syrian Army didn't bring its guns with them and didn't feel like a viable rebel group that could have kind of hijacked the revolutionary process. We could have tried to buy the nonviolent opposition more time uh, by trying to put pressure on the Assad regime and his allies to keep him from being able to wield repression in the way that he was able to. And then the third thing is we might have been able to help them in their knowledge base understand the need to not over rely on singular tactics like demonstrations, which are highly dangerous, um, and kind of shift between other types of methods. Now, I have no idea like whether that would have made this outcome any different, but I can tell you that I don't think armed struggle has done anything better uh, for the Syrian people than a well-executed civil resistance campaign would have done. That's what I got for you. Thank you. In democracies, we expect the majority to normally you know, be the one to influence policy. And you know, your presentation was alarming to me because we saw that it only takes 3.5% or an incredibly small minority mm -hmm. um, to make change. Yeah. And so I have a two-part question. Uh, was that concerning to you to discover just how influential such a tiny but vocal minority could be mm -hmm. um, in influencing policy? And second, um, do you think that by shining light on the success of such a small minority, uh, we will, in fact, empower more minorities, um, maybe even undermining you know, this notion that the majority should be the one to simulate change, because they don't necessarily have to. Right. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the, the first part of your question about like, the tyranny of the minority and like, how few people it takes, um, whether that's sort of subverting, subverting the democratic process, what I can tell you is that the way that we count participation is in terms of people who are actively doing, like confronting the opponent, observably. And I think it's really hard to get that many people taking those kinds of risks without overwhelming popular sympathy. So I'm less worried because of that, um, that these are the risk taker, takers in this society, but um, it's really difficult to take those risks unless you feel some kind of like inevitable change, I think, coming about. And so that's why it worries me a little bit less. But that said, I do think that there are some cases where this is abused. And uh, one of those cases might be Thailand, uh, where there's sort of these, you know, it's like the democratic institutions aren't maturing because people just overthrow <laughs> the, whatever government's in power right now because they don't like them. So that can happen. And then um, Egypt might be another example, uh, the, the 2013, um, uh, revolution slash coup, <laughs> depending on whose side you're on. And, and that's an example where uh, basically, you know, people didn't like the guy who was elected, and so they decided that they weren't going to wait for the next election to try to vote him out of office. They're just going to get him out right now. And they called up some of their friends in the military and said, you know, we'll support you if you step in, <laughs> right? So that, I think, might be an abuse. So the question is, uh, is there a just war theory of civil resistance? The answer is no. And uh, it might be something that one of you bright folks might take on as a thesis project to identify the conditions under which it's justified to wield this method of struggle. We have lots of different um, theories about when it's justified to use violence. And uh, we don't really have too many on when it's justified to use this. We have time for one last, we have time for one last question. Um, among, among the cases you studied, um, when uh, civil resistance was met with violent opposition, did it make a significant difference in the success rate? Uh, uh, and was there a significant ch uh, change in 
the viability of a violent resistance in those cases versus a nonviolent one? And also, was there significant differences in time it takes to impact change for nonviolent resistance versus uh, violent resistance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on your first question, um, it actually reduces the chances of success almost evenly. For nonviolent campaigns, it's about 7% reduction. And for violent campaigns, it's like a 5% reduction. But the really important thing to note is that the kinds of campaigns that we're studying almost universally were met with violence because they were trying to reformulate the state itself. So, I mean, they, they, it, it's a little bit difficult to really make a lot of inferences from that type of change, just be, uh, uh, of that uh, differentiation between the violent and nonviolent campaigns, given that they were all met with, with violence in this way. And then on your second question, um, I, I actually don't know whether the repression influenced the time that it took for the campaign to work, but the average civil resistance campaign is about three years and the average violent campaign is nine. So this is another one of those myths about civil resistance, like, oh, it just takes too long. Actually, <laughs> compared to the alternative, it's shorter. Um, and I, I, I have yet to really unpack why that's the case. Uh, but it, it does mean that, you know, it, it's another one of those data points that when you're sitting around over pizza and one of your like friends is like, you know, civil resistance might be great, but it's just going to take too long or whatever, you can say, actually, <laughs> it's three times shorter on average than the average violent campaign. I was that kid and, and um, I'm still that person. Um, but uh, anyway, it, it wins you lots of interesting friends. Well, thank you very much. No, thank you guys.